In this video, we're going to talk about an industry structure. What actually defines what an industry looks like, the competitors in that industry, the customers and suppliers that interact with that industry. So we're using the five forces model developed by Michael Porter, who is a researcher in the area of competitive analysis. And he says that essentially the industry structure is determined by five separate forces. Now for each of these forces for a specific industry, those forces might be strong or they might be weak. A strong force has a huge effect on that industry, whereas a weak force doesn't actually have that much of an effect. And we'll actually talk about strong and weak forces when we talk about each of the forces that are at play here. The first force we're going to be talking about is the bargaining power of a customer. This is essentially how much power a customer has that in order to control the price that you're offering your product or service for. So one example might be uh, a company that employs uh, visual effects uh, professionals. So a, a visual effects studio, there might be a lot of visual effects studios out there and some of the companies in the movie or TV making space are really powerful because there are relatively few of these companies and they can be huge. For example, Disney is a huge, huge company. They have, you know, all of their actual Disney properties, but they also have Marvel, for example, and they have a lot of power over how much they are paying for visual effects because if a company says, hey, no, I don't accept your prices, uh, we're going to charge you more, then Disney can just say, okay, we'll, we'll just work with someone else because they're big enough and they can really do that. Now, an example of a weak force is how much power you as an individual have over the policies of Allen Hancock College. You are one individual student and you rely on Allen Hancock in order to get a degree. So you in and of yourself can't actually make much change as a customer when it comes to the actual policies that Alan Hancock has. Now, of course, if a whole bunch of students banded together, then maybe they'd be able to afford some change if it could actually have an effect on how much money Alan Hancock is making off of students. But as an individual, one individual student as a customer of Alan Hancock cannot uh, afford much change because that individual student does not have very much bargaining power. The next force in play here is the threat of substitutions. So a strong force, a strong threat of, st of substitutions would mean that there are a lot of possible competing products that are out there on the market, whereas a weak force would be if your company happens to have the only version of that product. So for example, uh, in a grocery store, if you look at one type of cereal, if you look at say the Frosted Flakes, there are multiple different companies that offer Frosted Flakes. Sometimes there's the generic Frosted Flakes that might go for a little bit cheaper. And then there's the name brand Frosted Flakes from actually, actually from Kellogg's with Tony the Tiger on it and stuff such. Um, so there are substitutions here and the threat of the substitutions is uh it's non-zero now there's something to be said of the power of a name brand and how much people will go for that name brand over generics so maybe that threat of substitutions isn't the strongest but it is one to be contended with because there are enough people that will go for the generic brand that the generic brand actually is able to uh, maintain business in that field. Now, a weak force would be if you produce the only version of that product. Uh, Pfizer and Moderna, when they're making COVID vaccines, they, oh, and Johnson & Johnson as well, are the three big COVID vaccine produ producers for the United States. And there's not really that much of a threat of substitution for them because of that. There's not like 20 companies that can all produce COVID vaccines because they each have their own patented, patented ways of producing the COVID vaccine. So patents, monopolies, that kind of stuff can 
lead to a weak threat of substitution force. Then we have the bargaining power of suppliers because when you're trying to make a product or use a service or something like that, the suppliers that you rely on in order for your company to work will actually have some amount of bargaining power based on, you know, can you go to a different supplier or are they possibly the only one in the market? Or, you know, how big is that company? How much power do they have over you when you're purchasing their product? And those suppliers actually will be influenced by the five forces of industry themselves. So, you know, stuff like threat of substitution can actually influence their own bargaining power, which then influences the strength of bargaining power of the suppliers. The threat of new entrants into a market is another force. Uh, how easy is it for a new competitor to actually get into a market? So for example, the restaurant business, it is somewhat easy for a new restaurant to get started. Maybe they get started in a food truck or maybe someone is able to gain the capital to you know, buy a building, buy the equipment and that kind of stuff. It is a startup cost, but it's a relatively low startup cost when compared to something like trying to start a new cell phone ma manufacturer. With the restaurant example, the threat of, ent of uh, entrance is high because it's a lot easier to start a new restaurant. With a cell phone manufacturer, it's a low cost because you need to put in a lot of in initial investment. You need to hire a lot of people. You have to do a lot of research. You have to negotiate uh, contracts with suppliers who might already have very lucrative contracts with other companies. So that could be very hard. So all of those combine to uh, create a very difficult uh, industry to create a new company in. So if you have something like that, if you're already established in an industry that has now become difficult to get started in, that is a weak force. The threat of entrance is a weak force. Whereas if you are in a restaurant, threat of entrance is a strong force because someone might start a new restaurant down the street and if they're doing better than you, they might steal all your customers. And then in a similar vein is rivalry. So if other companies are able to get into your industry and they are able to build up, then they could easily become rivals to you and that would end up being a strong uh, force right there, a strong force that you have to contend with. On the other hand, if you're a big tech company like Google or Microsoft or something like that, you have a relatively small rivalry force because you don't really have a ton of competitors that you're going against. And maybe a lot of people already are using your services and stuff like that. Like with Google, it's probably, I, I believe it actually is the most used uh, search engine out there. So even though there are rival systems, um, it still doesn't really have a strong rivalry force because those systems are not used nearly as much as Google. So when I'm talking about this model right here, I want you to think back to last chapter when we were talking about abstract thinking as a non-routine cognitive skill. And the idea of this model and all of the other models that we're going to be talking about is you can think about, in this case, you can think about industry as a sum of five forces. And when you think about it this way, then what you can do is you can gain information about your place in that industry and then from there, if you have a whole bunch of strong forces in certain areas, you ha can build new systems in order to try to address those strong forces and try to gain some sort of competitive advantage that prevents those strong forces from actually uh, tanking your company. So this is the idea right here. We're using this to model the state of industry and to model our own positions within that industry. And then once we have that, we can use that understanding in order to build new systems. So that's a brief overview of industry structure. I want to keep this in mind as we continue on talking about competitive strategy. We'll be building competitive strategies based on the forces at play within our industry structure.